So, um, you'll have to deal with me to, again today for the last time, which is good, partially. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today, this title is Deliberately Misleading. Um, we'll start off being a discussion about what video games uh, were like and what video game hardware was like in 1982. Um, but as we'll see, video games don't actually remain a part of the story for very long. So, it's not, and, uh, so for those who are sick of it, things. It's not actually a talk about video games. It's actually a talk about generalized computer design and hardware and so on. Even though video games play a certain point, especially at the very beginning. So, in 1982, home video games are all the rage. They're really popular. People buy them for Christmas, buy them for their birthdays. Um, sometimes, although not as often as say Atari would like, people buy two copies of things, which is a bit silly. Um, TVs are, you know, fairly big and bulky, but families gather around them, and that's one of the main growing sources of entertainment. Um, so I was, I mean, it won't surprise you, but I was alive in 1982, um, so was Dave. Um, Tommy was not. Um, <laughs> don't, I don't have a picture of what he might have looked like in 1982, um, because me and well, I guess you could say that it's down here. Somewhere. Anyway, um, but that, it, was, it was a big deal, and for people of, say, maybe, well, maybe five years older than me, it was a significant home video games or a significant <coughs> form of home enter of entertainment, along with, you know, we're used to buying records, or, well, people don't buy records anymore, but you know what I mean, music being a source of entertainment, um, in those days that, that was a big deal, television was a big deal, but video games were significant as well. I don't know, Dave, amongst people your age, because you're older than I am, was that popular? Big deal? Very, very popular. Yeah, yeah so it was, it, was, it was fairly intense. And this wasn't entirely surprising, right? I mean, arcades had done well. Right? Arcades had been popular for a long time. First of all, there's pinball arcades, and then there's video game arcades. Arcade machines were more, more and more aggressive. There were totally awesome arcade games like Tempest, which is still pretty awesome. Um, there were games like Asteroids. Space Invaders took, took the world by storm. People really liked that, and they wanted some of that experience at home. They were sort of starting to get it using some video game hard, hardware home consoles that they could buy. That was good. So, one of the earliest, not the first, but one of the earliest successful ones was the uh, Atari 2600. Um, the hardware from which was mostly designed by a guy named Jay Miner. That name will come up again. And the Atari 2600 did very well. Its hardware design, which I'm not going to talk about, is extremely baroque and weird. And there is the reason that Almost no, 26, almost no Atari 2600 games have bugs is because the programmer had to be intimately familiar with every cycle that the processor ran, with every instruction, how many cycles that instruction would take. Remember, with that CPU I designed, every instruction was one cycle. Not so with the 60, with the 6502 in the Atari 2600. <coughs> Programmers had to be really familiar with that, and to such a degree that bugs were almost <coughs> impossible. Well, the Atari 2600 was a huge pain in the ass to program. It had 192 bytes of memory. It didn't have any video memory at all, really. It kind of did, but you sort of had to pound out the video <coughs> signal from the CPU. It was really obnoxious. Some people were looking for things better, but it did well, right? It was, it was a big seller. And lots of companies in 1982, they were doing really well with other video game systems. So, you know, at the time, you know, this, the boom was going to last forever, right? These names would live on and be Incredibly famous, the ColecoVision. Everyone would remember the ColecoVision and would see it as this fantastic piece of home entertainment. Um, it's guaranteed. They would probably also remember the Intellivision. You know, the Intellivision was, was really fantastic. People queued up to get it. They, you know, children would, would harass their parents to buy one. That was great. Um, some people bought the Vectrex instead. Um, that was, they, they were more tactically savvy, perhaps, but the Vectrex games were in black and white work very specialized and weird in comparison. Probably the best of these was the ColecoVision. But these are, names are obviously a big deal, and everyone remembers who these were. So if you were to look at these, and you would say were um, some dentists from Texas, you might look at this and say, well, this is pretty good. You know, this, this industry is really going places. And so we have, you know, have to cash in on this. It's doing really well. So let's get together with, some, with a bunch of people in our American medical in, um, industry uh, money that we rake in the cash, 
and let's invest money in the video games industry. And found a company to make an awesome video games console. And it will outsell everybody because video games will last forever. Well, so 1982, there were a bunch of other things going on in 1982, just to set the scene because probably, you know, most, most of the people here were not around in 1982. The home computers were getting to be a big deal. You know, people were, home computers were popular, people were using them. The internet didn't yet use IP. The transition from what's called NCP, the Network Control Protocol, to TCP IP protocols was on January 1st, 1983. So, although IP was understood, it wasn't used yet. Uh, Falklands War kicked off and got busy and so on, that was good. Um, bands like the Human League and Foreigner, um, they were zooming up the charts and stampeding everyone. Everyone was buying Foreigner albums. Um, a lot of people bought Human League albums as, as well, but Sheffield doesn't really seem much richer for it. Um, and Tron came out. Uh, War Games actually came a year after Tron. For people who are aficionados of films of that era, or people like me who saw them in the cinema, um, that was kind of a that's kind of a peculiar observation that war games is newer than toys. Space war games seem kind of lame, as, as, as well as the fact that they have Matthew Broderick. So this sort of thing was going on at the time the video game the video games craze was big, and uh, well, the, um, and so we have home computers. Such as things like you know, the TRS-80. Right? TRS-80 was a fairly popular home computer. You can end up, uh, if you boot it up, if you boot one up, you end up with something like, uh, let me do some clicking here. Yeah, that's nice. <coughs> There's no disk at this point. That makes sense because I have to give it one. I have to give it a floppy. And I'll do that. Oh, I don't know. I'll claim I have to click in the right spot. That would help. Oh. And I'll end up with, say, with, a, with a disc with a display of it like this. Uh, we'll make it great as small as we can see it. Um, I'll say, give it a, let's claim it. Let's be a bit correct. This is American, so 24. And we'll claim it's 1984, because of course this is not the year 2000 ready by any means. And so it's good, and we can do commands like DIR, and the computer behaves like that. And that's great. And I can run spreadsheets and write programs in BASIC, and the computer can make some beeping sounds, and that's awesome. The Model 4P didn't come out in 1982. The Model 3 came out in, I think, 81 or something like that. But this is around this sort of idea. This was people's expectations of where a home computer would be. Not necessarily video games, but home computer. By the way, as an aside, this is running in an emulator of uh, TRS-80s. I'll be using emulators a bunch during, um, during this talk during this lecture, partially because from the th hardware that's interesting, to the Model 4P included, I do actually own all the hardware of this, of, of the, that I'll be showing you, but the hardware is kind of bulky. Um, and it's now, you know, some of it's 35 years old. It usually works, not always. Um, it's phenomenally annoying to hook up to modern projectors. Anything <laughs> on this projector, I'd hesitate to call it modern, but you can see what I mean. And usually because of where I grew up, it's most of the hardware that I own is in my childhood bedroom, which is not in this continent, so it's a bit far away. So you'll be seeing a lot of emulators. So the TRS-80 could do that kind of thing, and people used it, and they were interested, and so on. There was, you know, if you went into the TRS-80, maybe you went to the Apple II. This emulator has sound. So there we are, I can type stuff. Uh, there isn't a program in memory right now. So if I type list, then it doesn't show me anything. I can uh, type, so I can do some graphics. For example, I can go into low-case graphics mode, and now I can plot some things on the screen, and it looks great. Uh, I can do high-resolution graphics mode as well, maybe. Uh, if I could type some basic code as well to do high-resolution graphics. Only eight colors, so not very impressive in that respect. And, you know, the things were fairly green screen. Things didn't very, very move very much. If I had a screen that had graphics on it, it didn't, nothing much happened. I mean, yes, things moved around, but the CPU had to do a fair amount of work to make things move around at all. So around there, that, that would exist. 
There was also, I don't recall stating any of this. And of course, there was the, you know, the behemoth, at least in North America, which sold extremely well yes. and was very popular. People liked it very much for game stuff. Its graphics were fairly good. One key aspect of the Commodore 64, the Commodore made, one key observation is that CPUs are slow. The CPUs of the day, anyway. Even nowadays, so the CPU is very fast, but it's not as fast at doing specialized things as custom hardware. So Commodore decided that their computers should really have custom hardware to make things better, to make things faster. And the C64 was no exception. A lot of what made the C64 interesting and special was made possible through the use of customized hardware, customized video hardware, customized sound hardware, and so on. So what I'm going to do is now show you, uh, you'll think this is very late, but you'll see why. I'll tell you why in a moment. I'm going to show you a YouTube video, assuming this works, uh, of somebody playing a game called Whizball. And the reason I'm doing that is because I could run Whizball on that emulator, but then I'd have to play it when I'm no good at playing video games anymore. 25 years ago, I was okay at playing Whizball. But, hopefully this will work. scrolls left to right, that's fine, but everything else that moves is very small. It doesn't contain, it doesn't occupy a lot of screen real estate. And although it's very responsive and this is made possible by the hardware that the C64 has, um, this game is also really, really hard. I don't know if anybody's played this ball, but it's really difficult to do well. This guy is pretty awesome, actually. Um, but the whole ethos of this is that this is what people were very much used to, is Things were kind of colorful, that's fine. But, aside from that, they were used to screens of text, like on the C64 and the other two. Or they were used to, or, or they were used to things like this, where things scrolled around, but not very big things moved. Okay, that's not bad. Oh, this guy did something, did something awesome with that. Anyway. So, that sort of sets the scene of what partially was going on in 1982. Oh, and I look like that. Um, Actually, that's a lie. This photo is from 1984. Because I don't have one from 1982. So, in order to be interesting, right, these, you know, not, I mean, the dentists just wanted to make cash, that's fair enough. But the engineers and so on that they employed, they wanted to make something phenomenally better. Just, it had to be just astronomically better than people had seen before. Do things that were generally, generally viewed as impossible. Certainly with some anything that human that humans, anything that individual consumers could afford. And this, in some sense, this is where the video game part of the talk ends, because the talk isn't over. But in 1983, the whole video game market basically imploded. It went from something like, I don't know, three billion um, US dollars in the US a year to a hundred million or something like that. Very quickly. A huge number of low quality games had were were released. They weren't very fun. Um, they were viewed as very, very being very expensive. The people who created them were incredibly arrogant. An Atari executive at one point said that they could basically shit in a box and that would sell. Well, that's essentially what they did, and it didn't sell. Um, so, video games. Are, people stopped caring about home video games. And this sort of thing had never really happened before. Now we're used to the fact that video games and consoles have a definite life. And that as one generation ends, then the next one wraps up. You know, there aren't very many hot PS2 games anymore, for example. We're used to that. But at the time, this had never happened before. So people assumed, first of all, that video games would go on forever. And then secondly, that video games were done forever. The home computer world still stayed around. Home computers were still, were still pounding away. C64 still sold all right. IBM was making fairly good progress with the PC. Um, I haven't talked about Atari at all, mostly because I don't know much about the 400, 800, 
160 XL, 800, you know, all that world, it was still doing fairly well. So these, fortunately, these dentists, the people who they had talked to, they were very stressed out by the video game market going away and imploding. So they asked their engineers, well, this thing that you're developing and you're working on, could it be a computer as well? And fortunately, the people who were working on it, this guy, James Wonder again, said, well, that was actually our plan all along. Is to build a computer that could be shoehorned into being a video games console. So the dentists were happy. So their goal was to build something that had phenomenally better graphics and sound than had been seen before. Now we're used to this idea, to, to the idea that graphics and sound, you can not get as much as you want by paying more. It doesn't quite work that way, but it's very good. At this point, what I showed you with Whizball was what people were used to. So in some ways, it was, they were easy to impress. So they started off with a few constraints when they were designing this thing to be so much better than before. And the constraints were, they basically had four. They wanted to work well in the home. And homes tend to have TVs, at least at the time certainly, TVs and stereos. So display output to a TV was a reasonable sort of thing. Maybe better quality output with a bespoke monitor or something like that. But displaying on the TV and stereo sound was kind of required. Stereo sound was a bit unusual at the time. Most machines didn't have it. We wanted it to be cheap-ish. Right? Well, not cheap as in a sort of 200 pound mark, but you know, they were aiming for like a grand or something like that. So you know, people could actually afford to buy one. Not, you know, 55 grand was no good. And during this time, things like the Macintosh came out, and they were pretty expensive. In the, 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 you know, the Mac was not, not cheap. The Mac was also extremely slow and frustrating to use. I mean, um, the first, you know, the original Mac 128K, it was really painful. It was, ugh, it was just not fun. So, and they also had knew that people, even though the home video game market had crashed, arcades were still chugging along. And so people had expectations that they could get something vaguely similar to what you would find in an arcade. So, they had to make, I'm getting ready for making a knife later on. There were a few preliminaries they had to do. Right? Some, initial key decisions they had to make in order to figure out what this thing would end up looking like. So, first of all, they had to write down what it could do, right? And they decided, <laughs> these things seem fairly obvious, right? You use color for graphics, people like color, that's fine. You need on-screen objects that can move quickly. So, in the version of Westfall that we saw, they, the, the on-screen objects could move fairly rapidly, but they weren't that big. So, really, this should say big on-screen objects that can move quickly because people were very impressed by that. We'll see why somewhat in a moment. Um, sound, they wanted to be able to, to make noise, and as soon as they got the go-ahead, if you will, from their funders to do a proper computer, they wanted disk as well. They wanted some way of storing stuff, storing files and so on. Now, at this time, disk meant floppy disk. Um, I, of course, don't have any, any with me. Uh, it's rapidly approaching the time. We have to, like an LP, you kind of have a laser disk, you kind of have to show people a floppy so they know what it is. Um, Sony had come up with a three and a half inch microfloppy and they thought that was cool, so they ended up using that. So, another part of this decision is how much work should the CPU do? So I talked about CPUs not being fast. And to, to realize that, think about, for example, a seven megahertz CPU. Seven megahertz was, you know, moderately fast, certainly for the home, fairly fast CPU for the time. <coughs> And let's suppose that the CPU is really awesome and can move in memory from one place to another in memory seven megabytes per second. Now that's not doable. It's probably more like two. But let's suppose the CPU is that awesome. Now, if we imagine the display on the screen, 320 by 200 pixels, okay, and, and we want 32 colors on the screen. So, for 32 colors, we need 5 bits per pixel. So that's 2 to the, two to the 5 is 32. So we need 5 of these things called bit planes. I'm not going to go into how bit planes operate. If you care, talk to me or Minzy, um, or read about them. I'm not going to go into it. So if we imagine we have this three, 320 pixel wide line, 320 divided by 8 gives us 40. So we have 40 bytes per line. We have 200 of them tall. It's 200 lines tall, so we have 8,000 bytes per bit plane. 
If you want 32 colors, we have five bit planes. So we have 40,000 bytes per frame of Im per image. So if we want to do 40,000 bytes per frame of image, suppose we want to do 30 images per second, which is not unusual for, for motion. 30 Im images per second, where each is 40 kilobytes, we end up with, what, 1.2 megabytes or thereabouts. So 1.2 megabytes per second of data have to be shoveled around in order to make this work. Now our CPU, our, our, our artificially amazing CPU, can do 7 megabytes per second. So we're consuming over one-seventh of the CPU's power just from shoveling data around. So we're left with some power of the CPU to do computation, to deal with the user, to deal with the disk, to maybe do some animation, but we're only left with six-sevenths of it. And realistically, the CPU is going to be nowhere near that good. It's going to be able to do maybe two megabytes a second. So we're using over half of it just to shovel data around. That's no good. So that's a really rough calculation, but the, but the illustration is that the CPU is not all that fast. Commodore realized this when they did the C64. Atari realized this during Monitor again when they did the Atari 400 and 800. And not surprisingly, Joe Monitor also realized this when he was working on this machine. But it needed a substantial amount of custom hardware in order to help the otherwise slower and crappy CPU. Well, so what CPU should we use, right? That's one of the first decisions. Remember, I, I showed you the, the uh, design of the, of the um, rather fatuously entitled um, Force AC 512 CPU. Um, it wasn't very good, but that was fine. They had to figure out, did they design their own? They decided not to. They decided to use a CPU from Motorola, the 68000, buy one. They decided they didn't have the resources to roll their own. Um, a, small, a couple of years later, a small company in, uh, well, a small company, a company that had a lot of success building computers in the UK, located around Cambridge, did design their own CPU. They decided that no, none of their were uh, was useful for it, so they designed their own uh, risk-based CPU. Uh, it was called the Acorn Risk Machine, um, and well, you know, it lives on today. Devices like this, ARM CPUs are everywhere, and they do very well. Um, no one's ever, Acorn is long gone, but ARM lives on quite happily. So anyway, that's a, a bit of an aside. Some companies do design their own CPUs, but this one decided not to. And they sort of decided that the CPU shouldn't really do very much. So we have to design a fair amount of custom hardware. And that was good. They knew a lot of hardware engineers who enjoyed designing custom hardware, and that was great. And they were full-on American. Now, they meet full-on American, um, that's fun to make fun of, but it's in critical for this because they were only thinking of deploying on American and other parts of the world that use the same video signal, televisions. So NTSC encoded video signals were the order of the day. And all the timings that I'm going to talk to you about, not extensively, but the timings I'm going to show you, are NTSC timings. That's why I said 30 frames per second, not 25. Eventually, it became popular enough that they did PAL versions, versions for other parts of the world. Numbers were a bit different. Instead of 320 by 200, it was 320 by 256. Instead of a number, another number of 262.5, it's whatever, 308.5. There were all sorts of changes like that. Not too quickly. So they initially made these decisions, right? They would do some stuff themselves and with custom hardware, but they would buy a CPU because they didn't want to do a full custom CPU. And fundamentally, the fundamental requirements, right? So we talked about what it has to do in terms of graphics and sound and stuff like that. But there are certain, because of that, there are things that are unavoidable. And the main thing that's unavoidable is a bunch of things need to be able to get at the memory. So we've seen, remember with the CPU that I showed you, it didn't really have memory, right? It fetched instructions and so on. But a real machine, <coughs> Memory stores the program, it stores graphics from the screen, it may store sound information, it stores, all, it stores everything. So all of these devices have to be able to get at the memory in the machine. And so the, the display hardware has to get at it, the sprite hardware, which I'm not going to talk a lot about, a lot about but hardware that's responsible for those things that move around very quickly, the disk, reading and writing to, to, to floppies, 
audio, the CPU, and this last thing, memory copying hardware, that I'm not going to say much about, but will turn out to be a big stalker. Those all need to be able to get at the memory of the machine. And because memory is only one device can get at it at a time, you need some kind of scheme to allow each of these devices to, to gain access to memory and retrieve what they need to retrieve. And one of the reasons that's critical is, well, think about what happens if access to memory is impeded. So, or if, if access to memory is a bit late. So suppose that display hardware needs to get some information from memory in order to form the display, in order to pay pixels on the screen. Similarly, with sprite hardware, it might have to do the same kind of thing. If you can't get the information in time, you have a corrupt display. Because the information needed to display for a correct display is just not there. So the, the electron beam, as I'll talk about in a moment, still scans across. The information for the display is not there, so you just end up displaying crapola on the monitor. That's not so good. Similarly, the disk needs data. When, when, the, when the disk is spinning around, the read-write head is above the disk, and it will do its thing. If the data are not there, well, too bad. Then you'll just end up writing you know, something random to the disk. Or, likewise, when you're reading from the disk, the read-write head will produce data right off the disk. You better be ready to, to store it into memory somewhere. Otherwise, the data will be lost or corrupted. And that's terrible. You end up with noisy audio. If you want to play some audio and the data are not there in time, because you couldn't get access to memory when required, well, then you lose. Then the audio ends up being noisy. The CPU can't get up memory when it needs to. Well, you can just wait. Things are a bit slower. And likewise with the memory copying hardware. And this was a key observation that they made, is that the CPU actually does not need immediate high priority access to the memory. It's not critical, in, in, as long as it gets access to the memory eventually, it's not critical because the rest of the user's interaction with the machine can just carry on. The user sees a fine display, music, audio keeps playing, data is not corrupted as it goes to and from disk, that's fine. It's just things take a bit longer. So this was another key observation that they decided. And they also made another fundamental decision, is that the video signal, remember this is going to be output typically to a television, the video signal is in charge of everything. All timing is based on what the video signal is about. I'll make a bit more sense in a moment. So the video signal, um, I think I will uh, attempt to use this thing and see what happens. So, you can just put up a diagram drawn by me. Good, it's making sure it's not going through. <coughs> that would be terrible. So, imagine this is, this is a screen. This is a monitor's display. It's not un unreasonable. And the way monitors worked, is that they would use raster scanning. So an electron beam at the back, the way a CRT would work is there'd be an electron beam at the back. The screen at the front, the electron beam would fire electrons at the screen. The screen was coated with phosphorus, or basically a, light, a, a material that when struck by an electron would give off light. The electron beam would be timed using, you know, using extreme care and magic so that it turned on and off at the right time and produced a display on the screen. And the electron beam would, would scan from left to right. So it would go across here, produce the first scan line of the image, then it would zip across and then do the next scan line, it would be this far apart, and so on and so forth. So the image was made up of these scan lines stacked on top of each other. And it would take a certain amount of time. It would take a certain amount of time for the electron beam to scan across the screen. 
So what these designers decided to do is they decided to say, okay, if the output is going to be on a television, what we shall do is make all the timing in our machine based on the time it takes the electron beam to scan across the screen. And that's a, a decision with extremely wide ranging implications. Oops, got my guy. So one of the implications of that is that all the clocks in the system, such as this probably somewhat bizarre, some point, point, point one, uh, one five nine or nine megahertz system clock, is that weird number because of the NTSC video signal timing. Each line is divided up into pieces of 279.365 nanoseconds. And that's because of, again, the length of time it takes the electron beam to scan from the left to the right. So what we have to do, going back to what I was talking about before, about the memory devices, is we have to arbitrate access to the memory. Right? Because multiple devices can't get at the memory at the same time. And this problem is a lot like they certainly knew about these things. Well, like the problems that communication networks, the computer networks face, is you have a bunch of users of the network, stations, computers, trying to communicate, trying to use the medium, trying to use the network similarly at the same time. And this is the same sort of problem. We have a bunch of devices trying to use the route into memory seemingly at the same time. So the solution was, and communications networks have done this for years, time division multiplexer. TDM. So what you do is you assign each of these devices a slot or a set of slots and you allocate a strict schedule for these device, for these slots for each device to make use of the access to the memory. And what you end up with is this. I prolonged this diagram. The text is not necessarily easy to read but I'll describe what the diagram is about. This is prosaically titled Figure 6.9, DMA Time Slot Allocation. What this is, this is spread over two lines, a single line of the electron beam of the picture. So the electron beam starts at the left, scans across, you can think of it this way, and scans across and eventually finishes at the right. So the, the, the timing is divided, the whole time is divided into slots, this 200 and whatever it was, nanoseconds. I can never remember. The first ones are used for dealing with mem memory housekeeping, memory refresh, and so on. Then come three, four, as it talks about here, disk DMA. So the, the disk, the floppies, are allowed access to the memory for those three slots. Then after that, the audio is allowed access for those four slots. Okay? Then after that, the sprites, the high speed display things that we saw a bit of a whiz ball, those sorts of things, they're allowed access to the memory for the slots that are in this sort of orange, yellowy, brown, not really orange, yellowy, brown thing. And then, all the rest of this is accessed by the display hardware to make the actual display appear on the screen. And this was a fairly critical decision of theirs because what you could do is you could then use the hardware to decide, you could tell the hardware, start fetching information from the memory to make up the display at any point along here, subject to some restrictions. Stop at any point along here, subject to some restrictions. And therefore, from the software, had immense control over the hardware's use of memory. And that ends up being, being really, really important because when you write software that, that really exploits what the hardware is doing, it has to think about and pay attention to these patterns of when it can access memory. These slots, say for example, these slots that are empty here, and here, and there, and there, those are slots that the CPU gets. The CPU can access memory there. But you'll notice in the black mode, black refers to a specific mode, there aren't any empty slots. So in that case, the CPU loses. The CPU can only get access to memory when the display, when the screen is not being drawn at all. And that can lead to a somewhat sluggish machine. 
But the idea was it was worthwhile. Because what's the merciful outcomes? We'll be a bit slow. So, as part of the hardware design, I'm not going to go through the details of what the hardware design is like. That will be probably an entire module over there. There are shift registers everywhere. So once you know that a certain set of pixels is going to have a certain set of colors, you gradually shift the bits out that represent those pixels to the hardware to make the video signal. And we can talk exactly about how that works later on if you want. If you have shift registers, you can load the video hardware from bitmaps in memory or from sprites. Audio is the same sort of thing. You fetch your memory, some audio data from memory, you shift it out to what is eventually connected to the stereo. Disk is the same sort of thing. The actual read-write out on the disk is a serial device. It takes one bit at a time. A bit more complicated than that, but basically that's what happens. You take data in memory, shift it out gradually to the disk. And you, when you build the hardware, this is what it looks like. There weren't FPGAs, really. This was in sometime in 1984. This was built. Um, there weren't FPGAs then, so you couldn't do something like I was demonstrating before. You actually had to painstakingly build it like this. Um, I expect most of the time this didn't work, uh, because, well, look, it's massive and really painful. So, there's a lot of hardware here that I've not talked about at all. Because this is not a discussion on what the hardware is capable of. So, there's a bunch of decisions that they had to make and design they had to do that are not hardware. I didn't talk about the memory copying hardware by any means. You can draw lines, you can use, you can use Bergenham's algorithm to draw lines on the screen far faster than the CPU could do. That was good. It can decode data from the disk. That's kind of weird. Was, this is one of the first machines that did not use specialized hardware to decode data from the disk. It used the bloody memory copy hardware. What's up with that? Totally weird. And there were facilities for, remember I talked about this, very, very detailed coupling, and tight coupling between the display line and the mem access to memory. You could synchronize other operations with the display as well. And there was hardware to assist you with. Now, there are a few things that this hardware does not do. It was a total dream at the time to be able to do effective 3D, right, to make that really, really impressive. Um, and that wasn't really doable for this. The CPU was way too slow to do all the maths that involved in doing 3D transformations and so on. You could get information about that from silicon graphics. That was fine. But that was not exactly cheap. Now, so 3D, they decided, well, 3D would be fairly difficult. Maybe not impossible, but fairly difficult. So something like this would be huge. 
So like this would be viewed by people as extremely surprising. But without 3D hardware, well, what are you going to do? There's no possible way of doing something like this. There was another thing that was pretty much impossible. There was no hardware support for full motion video. Remember what I talked about before, about how if you had a really fantastic CPU, you might be able to do a few seconds of full motion video. And at this point, Sur Silicon Graphics had very expensive hardware. Geometry Engine was their trade name for it. They could do 3D stuff, but really nobody had full motion video hardware. So that was pretty much impossible. And that was always a bit of a sore point. Everyone was very sad at the time that full motion video hardware proved to be fairly, fairly undoable. Well, Unfortunately, the emulator that I'm using here also emulates the speed of floppies, which is a bit frustrating. see why this works. It's based on the fairly clever observation that something that looks like video is really a lot of polygons. And if you don't have hardware that can, draw, that can do video at all, but you do have hardware that can help you draw and fill polygons, well, you don't need to stream the actual video, do you? You need to stream the description of what the polygons are. This is not very impressive at the moment, I suppose. 20 years ago, people would have thought this was pretty much impossible. So, in terms of all of this, the main point of it all. The main point of it is that most of what allowed this machine to operate and allowed them to do interesting things that they did was this fundamental and simple decision of synchronizing everything to what the video beam was doing. And because of that, they ended up with a memory architecture and a system architecture that allowed them to do a huge amount of stuff 
with a very slow CPU. The machine was still expensive. It was, you know, it was a lot more expensive than other cheap home computers at the time. But it gave other machines that say cost maybe 10 times as much a fairly substantial run for their money. And that is all I have to say.